Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Wardog Sec, back with another video for you guys. Today's video, we are going to continue on with Try Hack Me. This is the Junior Penetration Tester Learning Path, and this is the Vulnerability Research Module. This is the Vulnerabilities 101 room. Understand the flaws of an application and apply your researching skills on some vulnerability databases. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Task one, introduction. Cybersecurity is big business in the modern day world. The hacks that we hear about in newspapers are from exploiting vulnerabilities. In this room, we're going to explain exactly what a vulnerability is, the types of vulnerabilities, and how we can exploit these for success in our penetration testing endeavors. An enormous part of penetration testing is knowing the skills and resources for whatever situation you face. This room is going to introduce you to some resources that are essential when researching vulnerabilities. Specifically, you are going to be introduced to the following here. What vulnerabilities are, why they're worth, worthy of learning about, how are vulnerabilities rated, databases for vulnerability research, a showcase of, um, of how vulnerable our vulnerability research is used on Acme's engagement, and we've already read that, so let's go on to task number two here. I'm going to talk about introduction to vulnerabilities. A vulnerability in cybersecurity is defined as a weakness or flaw in the design, implementation, or behaviors of a system or application. An attacker can exploit these weaknesses to gain access to unauthorized information or perform unauthorized actions. The term vulnerability has many definitions by cybersecurity bodies. However, there is minimal variation between them all. For example, NIST defines a vulnerability as weakness in an information system, uh, system security procedures, internal controls, or implementation that could be exploited or triggered by a threat source. Vulnerabilities can originate from many factors, including a poor design of an application or an oversight of the intended actions from a user. We will come on to discuss the various types of vulnerabilities in a later room. However, for now, we should know that there are arguably five main categories of vulnerabilities, and here they are here listed in this table. The operating system. These types of vulnerabilities are found within the operating system, also known as the OS, and often result in privilege escalation, misconfiguration based. These types of vulnerabilities uh, stem from an incorrectly configured application or service, for example, a website exposing customer details, weak or default credentials. Applications and services that have an element of authentication will come with default credentials when installed. For example, an administrator dashboard may have the username and password of admin. These are easy to guess by an attacker. Application logic. These vulnerabilities are a result of poorly designed applications, for example, poorly implemented authentication mechanisms that may result in an attacker being able to impersonate a user. Human factor. Human factor vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities that leverage human behavior. For example, phishing emails are designed to trick humans into believing they are legitimate. As a cybersecurity researcher, you will be assessing applications and systems using vulnerabilities against these targets in day-to-day -day life, so it is crucial to become familiar with this discovery and exploitation process. All right, let's answer some questions down here. An attacker has been able to upgrade the permissions of their system account from user to administrator. What type of vulnerability is this? Well, this sounds like privilege escalation. If we check back up here, that would go under this operating system category here. So let's go ahead and plug that in there and continue on. You manage to bypass a login panel using cookies to authenticate. What type of vulnerability is this? That sounds like an application vulnerability. Uh, application logic vulnerability. So let's go ahead and plug that in there. There we go. And let's continue on with task number three here scoring vulnerabilities CVSS and VPR. Vulnerability management is the process of evaluating, categorizing, and ultimately remediating threats, vulnerabilities faced by an organization. It is arguably impossible to patch and remedy every single vulnerability in a network or computer system and sometimes a waste of resources. That's absolutely true. I've never worked in an organization where they were 100% remediated when it came to uh, vulnerabilities. After all, approximately 20% uh, of vulnerabilities only ever end up being exploited, according to Kenna Security article here from 2020. Instead, it is all about addressing the most dangerous vulnerabilities and reducing the likelihood of an attack vector being used to exploit a system. This is where vulnerability scoring comes into play. Vulnerability scoring serves as a vital 
role in vulnerability management and is used to determine the potential risk and impact a vulnerability may have on a network or computer system. For example, the popular Common Vulnerability Scoring System, CVSS, awards points to a vulnerability based upon its features, availability, and reproducibility. Of course, as always in the world of IT, there is never just one framework or proposed idea. Let's explore two of the more common frameworks and analyze how they differ. The first one, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. First introduced in 2005, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS, is a very popular framework for vulnerability scoring and has three major iterations. As it stands, the current version is CVSS version 3.1 with version 4.0. Currently in draft, a score is essentially determined by some of the following factors, but many more. Number one, how easy is it to exploit the vulnerability? Number two, do exploits exist for this vulnerability? Uh, number three, how does this vulnerability interfere with the CIA triad? In fact, there are so many variables that you have to use a calculator to find out the score using this framework. A vulnerability is given a classification out of five, depending on the score that is has uh, been assigned. Uh, I have put the qualitative severity rating scale and their score ranges into the table below. And here you have here, you got it from zero to 10, you're at none, low, medium, high, and critical. However, CVSS is not a magic bullet. Let's analyze some of the advantages and disadvantages of CVSS in the table below. All right, advantage right here. CVSS has been around for a long time. Disadvantage, CVSS has never designed was never designed to help prioritize vulnerabilities and said just assign a value of severity. CVSS is popular in organizations. CVSS heavily assesses vulnerabilities on an exploit being available. However, only 20% of all vulnerabilities have an exploit available, according to this Tenable article here. CVSS is a free framework to adopt and recommended by organizations such as NIST. Vulnerabilities rarely change scoring after assessment, despite the fact that new developments such as exploits may be found. Now let's talk about vulnerability priority rating, VPR. The VPR framework is a much more modern framework in vulnerability management. Developed by Tenable, an industry solutions provider for vulnerability management, this framework is considered to be risk-driven, meaning that vulnerabilities are given a score with a heavy focus on the risk a vulnerability poses to the organization itself rather than factors such as impact like CVSS. Unlike CVSS, VPR scoring takes into account the relevancy of a vulnerability. For example, no risk is considered regarding a vulnerability if that vulnerability does not apply to the organization, i.e. they do not use the software that is vulnerable. VB, or VPR is, is also considerably dynamic in its scoring where the risk that a vulnerability may pose can change almost daily as it ages. VPR uses a similar scoring range as CVSS, which I have also put into the table below. However, two notable differences are that VPR does not have a none slash informational category. And because VPR uses a different scoring method, the same vulnerability will have a different scoring uh, use using VPR than using CVSS, which makes sense. And this is a table of their scoring, right? Same thing here, zero to 10 and going from low to critical. See how they, it does not have uh, none or informational unlike the CVSS as, as it's stated here. Let's continue on. Let's recap some advantages and disadvantages of using VPR framework in the table below. All right, some advantages right here. VPR is a modern framework that is real world disadvantage. VPR is not open source like some other vulnerability management frameworks. VPR considers over 150 factors when calculating risk. VPR can only be adopted a part of a commercial platform. VPR is risk driven and used by organizations to help prioritize patching vulnerabilities. VPR does not consider the CIA triad to the extent that CVSS does, meaning that risk in, to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data does not play a large factor in scoring vulnerabilities when using VPR. Scorings are not final and are dynamic, meaning the priority a vulnerability should be given can change as the vulnerability ages and initially left blank. What year was the first iteration of CPSS published? And I believe that was 2005. If you wanted to assess vulnerability based on the risk it poses to an organization, what framework would you use? Well, we're gonna use VPR. Right, because that's risk based. If you want to choose a framework that is free and open source, well, that's going to be CVSS. There we go. Now let's continue on to task number four vulnerability databases. Hey, everybody, just a quick little blurb here. As you can see here, most people that view my channel are not subscribers. If you're new here, 
please consider subscribing to the channel if you're enjoying the video please consider hitting the like button it helps get me in the algorithm help spread the good word out there helps bring more people and increase our glorious community here all right i'm all about helping out others i know what it's like to come up in cybersecurity or even try to get into cybersecurity and not knowing where to look i'm just having this channel up so i can help out other people all right that's all i got all right now as we take a look through this nvd search here what you want to do is under search type go to advanced so you can get a more concise way of searching for stuff. Then you're gonna set this to the applicable values in here, 7, 1, 2021, 2, 7, 31, 2021, right? And then you're gonna hit the search button here and it should display the information up above here. There are 1,554 matching records. So that's what you're gonna plug in there for the first question. And the second question is, who's the author of ExploitDBs? And if we go up here to the top right, to this information icon, click, uh, about ExploitDB, right? And I'll take you to this page here and it says that it's maintained by OFSEC. So there you go. Now let's go ahead and continue on to task number five, an example of finding a vulnerability. And let's see what they have to say for us. In this task, I'm going to demonstrate the process of finding one minor vulnerability coupled with some research of the vulnerable or vulnerability databases leading to a much more valuable vulnerability and exploits ultimately. Throughout an assessment, you will often combine multiple vulnerabilities to get results. For example, in this task, we will leverage the version disclosure vulnerability to find out the version of an application. With this version, we can then use ExploitDB to search for any exploits that work with that specific version. Applications and software usually have a version number. This information is usually left with good intentions. However, the author can support multiple versions of the software and the likes, or sometimes left unintentionally. For example, in the screenshot below, we can see that the name and version number of this application is Apache Tomcat 9.0.17. We can see that here at the top left of the screenshot, right? And it says, with this information in hand, let's use the search filter on ExploitDB to look for any exploits that may apply to Apache Tomcat 9.0.17. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this here and like so. Okay, great. After searching exploit DB, there are a total of five exploits that may be useful for us um, for the specific version of the application. Um, question time. What type of vulnerability did we use to find the name and version of the application? An example, what well, we saw that up above here, that was uh, version disclosure. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste that over here. And then you'll see this quite a bit, this this method of discovering um, potential um, exploits, right? You're going to find the version of a particular software, et cetera, and then, you know, might do some Googling or maybe you just go straight to the site or maybe you'll search Kali Linux, right, using like search exploit or something like that. But yeah, just to show you an example of this, let's go back over to the site real quick and let's go back to the main search page here and search box here. Let's type this in and it brings up the applicable um, information, right? You can sift through here. Now let's bounce back over here and we're gonna continue on with task number six, showcase exploiting Acme's application. Now let's see here. It is your first week on the job as a junior penetration tester at the penetration testing company. For your first engagement, you are shadowing a senior penetration tester within the company. Deploy the attached site to this task and follow the steps that the senior penetration tester took to exploit a vulnerability against Acme IT services infrastructure. It says complete the engagement to retrieve the flag. Follow along with the showcase of exploiting Acme's application to end uh, to the end to retrieve a flag. What's the flag? So let's go ahead and try this. All right, it says we're the first, basically same information already displayed up here. First week here, we're the junior penetration tester. We're shadowing the senior. So let's go ahead and hit continue. And this looks like some email or something. All right. It says, thank you for taking on this engagement. Please document every step extensively for the new junior penetration tester to follow. I have attached our company reporting template to help with this. As a reminder, Acme IT services only want you to test the IP address here. Any other IP or machines out of scope? Good luck, Joe, customer liaison. And, and that's all you can click around in here. Yeah. All right. So let's click next. Information gathering. At this stage, the senior penetration tester has used a public service that compiles some details about the target company. As we can see, Acme IT services provide IT services to 800 plus clients. This information is useful because we can begin to think of possible software that they are using 
for us to attack, for example, help desk or a support application. And this is the information they were just talking about here. Companies report established 2017 corporation, IT support services, 800 plus. The CEO is Danny Phantom, uh, d.phantom at acme.thm. Danny Phantom, isn't that like a cartoon show or something? Anyway, uh, number two, enumeration and scanning. The senior penetration tester now moves on to the enumeration and scanning stage of the engagement. This stage helps establish services and applications running on Acme's infrastructure. We can use the information gathered from the scan to begin to understand what services may be viable to attack. For example, a web server hosting a website recall from our email. We are given the uh, IP address, the following here. Try scanning this IP address yourself. And this is when like Nmap and such comes into place, right? So go watch my Nmap videos if you're unfamiliar with Nmap. Let's go ahead and continue here. Run Nmap request and let's see here. All right, so let's see. We're gonna have to get that IP back. I'm gonna go ahead and grab it from that email like so. There we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to this Nmap and plug this in, run it. All right, now let's see what comes back here. And it says that these following ports are open, 22 running open SSH, or just running SSH. Uh, port 80 is open, running HTTP, port 443 is open, and it's running HTTPS. Now let's continue on. Application testing. Using the information gathered from stage two of penetration engagement, the junior penetration tester has visited the target in their web browser and has been greeted with a login page. The senior penetration tester guesses some random passwords such as admin admin to no avail. They notice a version number of the application 1.5.2 and take note of this. This will be useful for the next stage. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this. I don't know, I'm not sure if we're gonna be plugging this in somewhere or not, but let's go ahead and grab it. And this is the login portal here. Let's click next. Vulnerability research. The senior penetration tester recalls that Acme IT Services uses an application called Acme Portal that has a version number of 1.5.2. The senior penetration tester visits a vulnerability and exploit database called Vulnerability Bank uh, trademark. This website stores details of vulnerabilities and exploits for applications. The senior penetration tester searches the site for the software that was discovered in uh, stage three. They're in luck. There is one vulnerability listed for that application and version. Remote code execution, RCE. RCE vulnerability allows commands to be exe uh, executed on the target system. The senior penetration tester could use this vulnerability to gain access to the console of the target. Try searching the vulnerability bank for an exploit for Acme Portal 1.5.2. All right. Oops, I didn't meant to do that. Let me go back to here real quick. All right, I guess that's end of it. I don't see anything else. Stop that and, but all right. So this is what it looks like here, and let's go ahead and plug this in. Actually, let me. I need to grab the whole thing. So let's do this here. There we go. Now let's go and search. All right, remote code execution. There it is. And step number five is exploitation. Accumulating the information from all the previous stages, the senior penetration tester uses the exploit downloaded from uh, Vulnerability Bank against Acme Web application on this following IP address. The exploit is successful and abuses the remote code execution RC vulnerability to launch a reverse shell on Acme's infrastructure. From here, the senior penetration tester can look for files of values such as passwords, backups, or application source code. And this is what it looks like here, running exploit against that particular system here. And who am I? I am the administrator. Awesome. And show flag. If you get an RCE on the customer's environment, you are like extremely lucky because that's not too common these days to have an RCE, from, to my knowledge at least. Um, usually those login portals, you're going to be trying some kind of um, password guessing, brute force, credential stuffing, or something like that to break in to their systems. All right, task number seven, uh, conclusion. So we're going to wrap this bad boy up here. Let me exit out of this. Nice work. We've made it to the end. This room has served as an introduction to vulnerability research and some skills and resources this requires where you have practical or practically applied this knowledge. Uh, continue on your learning with additional rooms in this module. So we're going to continue on in the next video. But that wraps up this video. Thank you all for taking the time to watch be sure to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe.